Good evening. I'm Karen Taylor. I'm Program Director of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's event, which is part of the Labour, Literature and Landmark Lecture Series. The Labour, Literature and Landmark Lecture Series are supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Um, I would also like to express our gratitude to Thomas Donahue, who's created a special window for tonight's event. So please have a look at that um, on your way out. Um, for those of you who are less familiar with the General Society, and I hope you don't mind me asking, but is there anybody who this is your first visit? Oh, well, well, uh, well, uh, well uh, welcome, uh, welcome to uh, returnees and to our first time visitors. Um, the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York was founded in 1785 by the skilled craftsmen of the city. Today, our 233-year-old organization continues to serve and improve the quality of life for the people of the City of New York through our educational and cultural programs. These include our tuition-free Mechanics Institute, the General Society Library, of course, of which you're in this evening, um, our upstairs lock museum, and by the way, after the program tonight, you are welcome to go up and have a look at that, and our nearly 200-year-old lecture series, of which this lecture is part of. Uh, you will find uh, additional information on the Society in a blue and white postcard on the front table, and also some information on library membership. Tonight, is the final literature lecture in our series, and I'm so pleased that we have an opportunity to present an outstanding independent press, Bellevue Literary Press. Bellevue Literary Press is devoted to publishing literary fiction and non-fiction at the intersection of arts and science. Publisher and editorial director, Erica Goldman, We'll discuss Bellevue Literary Press, its history, its philosophy, its digital development, and the realities of being an independent publisher in 2018. She will be joined in conversation by author Diane DeSanders, who will describe her path to publishing her first book, Hap and Hazard and the End of the World. And I do want to mention very importantly that this book is for sale and I'm sure Diane would be happy to, to sign any purchase copies. Erica Goman, as I mentioned, is publisher and editorial director of Bellevue Literary Press. She has been an editor of fiction and nonfiction at several publishing houses in New York City uh, before founding Bell Bellevue Literary Press. She has lectured and taught at Yale's Writers' Conference, the Wesleyan Writers' Conference, and New York's University Center for Publishing. She's also an instructor at the New York University School of Medicine, Division of Medical Humanities. Diane DeSanders is a fifth generation Texan. Uh, and between careers as a history teacher and antiques dealer, has worked in regional theater in almost every capacity. Hap and Hazard and the End of the World is her first novel. I am so pleased to introduce to you Eric Goldman and Diane DeSanders. And to start the discussion, I'm going to ask a few questions and join them. Erica, I'm going to start with you. First off, can you explain a little bit more about the mission of publishing literary fiction and non-fiction at the intersection of the arts and sciences? Well, our mission is de facto an amalgam of my publishing experience because when I first got into publishing as a young editor, I worked for a variety of literary commercial houses, and then deviated into popular science publishing. And uh, at a moment when I was in between jobs, I began work on editing as a consultant a novel by Jerome Lowenstein, who is a physician and the nonfiction editor 
of the Bellevue Literary Review, which had been published uh, its first, its first uh, edition or its first issue was published coincidentally with 9-11. And their mission was to uh, bring literary voices to uh, focus on health and illness. And so I pitched the idea of doing a book press at that same nexus and a year later, I was sitting at a desk at Bellevue Hospital in the Department of Medicine. So. Wow, well that's, that is a very unique history to, uh, to independent publishing. Yeah. Um, Diane, yes. I would like to also discuss, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to discuss your path to getting published, because I believe it is also a, a, a unique path. Um, yes, it is, I guess. It's taken me quite a long time. I first wrote, some of the things in this book were written maybe 30 years ago. So uh, it has taken me a long time, but I had, you know, husbands and children and all kinds of stuff and was stuck in Dallas, Texas for quite a long time. I came to New York about 30 years ago and decided to be serious about writing. I mean, I'd always written, but, um, um, you know, I didn't really get serious about it until then. And um, I started getting little stories published, and I had some poems published, and then I met uh, an editor at the SMU Literary Festival in Dallas. Uh, I'd gotten involved with the English department there, and I volunteered to have the dinner at my house, and it was Gordon Lish. And so uh, he came and sort of challenged me. He published some of my poems. He sort of challenged me to come to New York, and because I told him I'd always wanted to come to New York ever since I was about 14. I wanted to come here and, you, you know. Tell, you should tell us who Gordon Lish is. Because Gordon Lish is a, uh, was an editor of, uh, um, he was an editor at Random House and he started a little uh, publication that was called The Quarterly and it was to introduce new writers. And he took a bunch of poems of mine, he, then he started taking my stories, and he just took everything for a while. I was the big star of that for a short time, and uh, um, what can I say? And then we had some disagreements, and um, I ended up just kind of sitting in my room for quite a long time, and uh, not even working on publishing, really. And then I decided to do the book, and I um, wanted to uh, start right at the top. And so I started looking for agents, famous agents, and all that kind of thing, and got rejected a lot. And uh, it took me, you know, many years of going back and forth. Whenever I couldn't go forward on the book, I would get depressed, and so I would go work in theater for a while, which always cheered me up because it's a lot of fun. And um, then I would decide, oh no, I can't do this, I have to go back to the book. So I'd work on that, I'd get stuck, I'd go back into theater, da 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 da, I went back and forth. I did a lot of different things. Um, finally, I uh, kind of reconnected with an old friend from Lish's classes named Dawn Raffle, who's an editor uh, who does freelance editing. And she helped me with it a lot and put it together and suggested that I take it to Erica. And so I did, and Erica is awesome in her uh, uh, wonderfulness to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not hard. <laughs> And so uh, she seemed to get it. She thought it was great. She wanted to take it, and she said, oh, but you have to turn it back into a novel. So I've spent some time doing that, and um, here we are. So it was more a memoir at that point? It was, I decided after all the many years of working on it, first I did it as a memoir, first I thought of a novel, then I decided, oh, it's a memoir. So I made it a memoir. Then I made it into a story collection. Finally, I decided I'm, I can't do a novel. I just can't do it. So I'm a, basically a miniaturist at heart. So I made it into a story collection. 
And then um, Erica said, no, no, turn it back into a novel. So I uh, spent some time doing that. And actually, I learned so much doing that, you know, that I think I could write another novel. Uh -huh. You know, it's like I learned how to make a structure and how to make it fit together, which was one of the problems I always had. I knew I could write. I mean, I knew I could write a great sentence or a great paragraph, but I just couldn't handle uh, the structure and the narrative arc of a whole book. You know, I was just intimidated by it, I guess. It's a tough, it's a tough not to crack. It is. And it's very difficult. Publishers tend to um, steer writers to into producing novels, uh -huh. and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, I often feel when I pick up a contemporary book that everybody's crowing about that it fizzles out. Yeah, I do too. The end. I do too. That was. Part of what was so mystifying about being constantly rejected because everybody would say, oh, your writing's so great, oh, it's so interesting, da 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 and so then when you get rejected a lot, it's confusing. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me then, do you think then that partly it, this, um, related to the definition of a good book, of course, is a good editor? Right. It is. And, and someone, but is it also then when Erica like believed in you and believed in your book, that also gave you the confidence it to did. shape your book in another it, way? It did. When you're right. writing for someone that kind of believes in your writing and what you're doing, or acts like they do, then <laughs> <laughs> you're it, the it inspires you. It really inspires you because all the year when I first came up here and was start and was getting published with Gordon Lish, I was it was I was so happy because I had someone who thought I was good and was editing me and encouraging me and all that. And so I turned out a tremendous amount of material. And then uh, when I lost that, I uh, sort of entered the woods, you know, for a while. I just couldn't do it. Right. Also, I smoked too much pot, <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, you know, it does make you fat and lazy. So uh, I spent too much time being confused and messed up, you know. But I did a lot of other things during that time, which were, you know, whatever. But it's all worked out well. It has I sound all like worked out. What? I believe it Sorry. has all worked out. And I think this might be a good opportunity to ask you to read an extract from okay. your book. Okay. okay. And I just mean, Carl, this, this lethal wire. Okay, thank you. Okay, this is uh, chapter two, called The Age of Reason. Can you hear this right? Is this right? Okay. Daddy sits on one end of the dinner table, Mama at the other. I sit between them on one side. On the other side, opposite me, sits a baby, the elder of two babies, in a high chair pulled up to the table. The other baby's still in a crib in the back room. The maid is in the kitchen, waiting to be called. There are placemats and stainless steel. Our napkins are in our laps, and we sit up straight at the dinner table. We do not sing or whistle or read at the dinner table. We do not interrupt. We do not tap or kick the chair legs or swing our feet back and forth at the dinner table. White bread is stacked on a plate. Salad plates are set before us. Iceberg lettuce, section cut red tomatoes, a pink dressing. I poke my fork at it. Don't play with your food, says Daddy. Eat your salad, says Mama. Normally I would argue saying, I hate salad and trying to bargain for something. But just then Mama says, you should eat that salad instead of so much bread and cookies. That's right, you know, says Daddy, you are getting fat. So that's that. 
Everyone is tense, because for the older baby across from me, tonight's dinner is a test. Will she or will she not be able to eat properly enough to stay and have a place at the table throughout the meal? This would be a first. It doesn't look good for the baby, as she has just caused a bit of cut-up tomato to fly across the table and land on the bread plate, and Daddy saw it land. Daddy groans. Daddy doesn't like having a baby at the table. Mama reaches and takes the tomato into, onto her own plate, saying, that's all right, it's just one little thing, Dick. A few drops of tomato wetness are sitting on the plate, threatening to spoil the perfection of the white slices, but maybe he doesn't see it. I look across at the baby. She hasn't noticed what's happening yet. She's a happy baby, almost three now, with bright black eyes. Everyone says every single day how she is so cute, which makes me want to do something to her. I eat a few tomato bites and push my lettuce around. Daddy devours his salad in seconds. Mama eats slowly, cuts up her lettuce with care. The baby drops her baby fork on the floor with a clang. Daddy flinches, looks at Mama. Mama picks up the fork. Mama stands and picks up her plate and mine. Jane, says Daddy. Yes, Dick, says Mama. Let the maid do it. That's okay, I need to get something from the kitchen, and she walks out with the salad plates, then returns quickly, carrying dinner plates, followed by gigantic May May, the white uniformed black maid, carrying a platter with meatloaf. May May is as tall as Daddy, so dark that sometimes I can barely see her Indian sharp features, and hugely big. Her uniform doesn't fit right, apron crooked, slip hanging out. I see Daddy noticing this. He has a look on his face. Daddy doesn't like May May, says she's a slob. But Mama says May May loves the babies and is a good soul. Mama sits. May May goes back to the kitchen, cut open loafers flapping, then brings out mashed potatoes and peas. Daddy begins slicing the steaming meatloaf, his bird-like eyes appraising its blanket of tomato sauce and slices of bacon on top. We pass our plates. Jane, how many times do I have to say I want it pink in the middle, says Daddy. It is pink in the middle, says Mama. You call that pink, says Daddy. It looks pink to me, says Mama. Well, next time, he takes a long breath, exhales it, then speaks slowly. Could you please make it pinker than this, he says. He isn't that mad yet. Mama takes a plate for the baby and starts cutting up small bites. I am seven now, and I cut up my own food. The baby bangs excitedly on her tray. Daddy leans and suddenly grabs her little arm. Her eyes widen. We all freeze. Now, do you think you can settle down and eat right? He says, holding her arm, glaring into her face. Her little face crumples. She starts to cry. Mama shoves a bite of mashed potatoes into her mouth. She stops crying and works to swallow. We, received our, we receive our filled plates and start to eat. I watch each of them, and I watch the baby staring wide-eyed at Daddy. She's starting to catch on. I am waiting for my moment. Thanksgiving has passed, and Christmas is coming. I'm in second grade now, not a baby anymore, and I hear the things other kids say. I'm ready to hear the truth. Even though I pretty much know the answer, I need to hear it from the two of them. I've taken my questions mostly to mom up to now, but this time I've waited until they're both here at the table because daddy will often tell you things, and I am, al I am always looking for somebody to tell me things. For example, one time daddy showed me how to use the index in the book of knowledge, and he told me to always find things out for myself and to think about things for myself and not just take what other people say. And one day last summer at the dinner table, Daddy told me about the solar system. I had asked about the man and the moon. Was there such a thing as a man and the moon? Was this a man living inside the moon or what? And if so, what about the moon being made of green cheese? How did that fit in? And what about the cow jumping over the moon? Could that happen? I couldn't imagine the cows I'd seen at Aunt Lee's farm jumping over much of anything, so which of these things was true and which not true? 
When I said this, Daddy looked over at me with sudden interest. You see this, Daddy had said, holding a fat red radish right in my face. Mama seemed to think something was funny, but Daddy pushed back his chair, went clump clumping into the kitchen without his cane, grabbed a grapefruit, an apple, an orange, a lemon, and came back to the table, Mamie behind him looking out the swinging door with a face of alarm. What could he be doing now? Then this rare thing happened. Daddy leaned forward to me and started showing and telling me about how all things in the huge universe revolve around each other, how all things are affected by each other, how the sun is this gigantic ball of fire, the moon a small cold planet that mirrors it. Mama said, oh, she can't understand all that, Dick. Yes, I can. Yes, I can, I shouted, jumping up and down in my chair, hoping he would never stop. And he did go on and on, looking right into my eyes as if I were a serious person, not just a little kid to be brushed aside, telling me how the earth we live on is actually a wet green ball constantly whirling around and around. And yet we don't feel the whirling and whizzing through space because we're stuck to the earth like magnets by this thing called gravity that even the wisest men in the world don't really understand. But the wise men are studying it right now. Daddy picked up rolls and olives to show how all the planet whirls are rolling around the super hot sun, while the sun is boiling up a billion explosions all the time, even though we humans are walking around on Earth every day and not noticing a thing. He drew pictures on napkins, talking low, leaning forward to me, confiding the secrets of the universe into my eager ear, including little kid me inside his mysterious smart daddy circle. It was thrilling. I would ask questions. He would get pencils and rulers and answer, and mother would keep on protesting from the other side, trying to put a stop to this. After dinner, I ran out to the backyard to look up at the moon and wonder at the millions and trillions of stars. The dark yard didn't seem just so scary with all those stars out there. The sun, the moon, the stars. <laughs> In spite of everything, I'd have to like Daddy forever for this. But Mama didn't like this for some reason. Why didn't she like for Daddy to talk to me like that? What was she so worried about? Why didn't Mama want me to know things? The baby is putting her fingers into the mashed potatoes, then into her mouth. Peas fall to the floor and bounce. Daddy groans. Mama jumps up. The baby looks from one to the other and starts to cry. For some reason, I want to save her. Kids at school say there's no Santa Claus, I blurt out loudly, even though this is not my perfect moment yet. Who says that, says Mama. Is it Nathan? No, it's not Nathan, just kids at school. Mama looks mad. The baby is fussing and twisting in her high chair. She knocks a glass of milk that spills across the table, then rolls off and shatters on the floor. Good God, Jane, Daddy jumps up as if a bomb went off and gasps as if hit by it, then stands, pushing back his chair, which falls on the floor with a clatter. He grabs his cane with one fist, tottering, grabbing the table. I duck down. The baby freezes for a second, holding her breath, then makes a long, high-pitched sound. Mama stands, calling for May, May, who rushes in with a towel as if she'd been waiting just behind the door. Out, take her out of here, shouts Daddy, clump clumping away from the table, turning his back, as if he can't stand to look while the whole world explodes into a million pieces. The poor baby has failed again. She shrieks in protest as Mama carries her to the kitchen, then to the bedroom, banished. <coughs> Excuse me. May May cleans down on the floor, shaking her head. I eat what's on my plate as fast as I can. We hear the baby screaming from the back rooms, but everyone settles down again. Then the littler baby wakes up fussing. May May goes back there and closes the door. So we three eat in silence, Daddy woofing his food the way he does, as if starving, Mama frowning and picking at hers. Finally, she speaks. It's Nathan, isn't it? I'm going to speak to his mother. No, it's not Nathan, I yell. It's not. Mama doesn't answer. Maybe this is an opening. 
But it's true, isn't it? There's no real Santa Claus, Mama. Not really, is there? Why won't you tell me? Because how could he fly around to all the houses in the world in one night? And how could he know what everybody wants for Christmas? How? He just does, that's all. Maybe you don't know everything there is to know. Did you ever think of that? What about all those presents you got from Santa last year? You liked getting all those presents, didn't you? Yes, but what about, well, maybe if there's no Santa Claus, we should just forget about Christmas this year. Mama's angry now, her forehead wrinkled. Why does she look like something's hurting her feelings? What makes you think you know so much? I just don't see. You have to believe, she says. It's important to just believe. You have to. I look at Daddy. He's watching the two of us with a little smile. I figured Daddy might understand because there was just something about Daddy. But Daddy is watching Mama. He looks me right in the eye and says, I think you should consider the fact that your mother might be right. Mother, Mama laughs, but I don't get it. Well, I think Daddy wouldn't lie to me. The end. <laughs> So that's what it's about. <laughs> Am I coming back over yeah, there? Okay. So. So, so, th so thank you. You're welcome. As you, as you hinted before, it is partly autobiographical, is that correct? Yes, it is. It's very autobiographical, right. which was one of my hang-ups with it. My mother hated me writing about them. She was always saying, don't write about me, wait till I'm dead. So that's one of the reasons it took so long. <laughs> but, um, because you can hear your mother's voice. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. But um, what I love about um, not only that section that you read, but throughout the book is how the details reveal the place and time so uh -huh. beautifully. I mean, Thank the iceberg you. lettuce and the pink salad dressing. Oh, and right, the, right, right, um, it's, right. It's, uh, you didn't give us any context, but for those in the audience who haven't yet read the book and may not have gleaned it from this section. It's set, much of the book is set um, right after the Second World War and Daddy uh, clumps around with a cane because he was badly injured yeah, in the war. Yeah, he was badly injured in North Africa during World War II. And um, that was part of the problem in the family is he really had, um, uh, what do they call it? PTSD. Uh, PTSD. And um, he had a lot of problems and was very crazy. And my mother was kind of a nice, sweet sorority girl who just wanted everything to be nice. And uh, that put them very much at odds. So I really spent so much of my childhood thinking, what exactly is it that's wrong? You know, and that was one of my motives in writing the book, was trying to figure out what was going on. And uh, a lot of it I just made up, you know, because I didn't really know, but I had my theories about it. But uh, well, that's the beauty of fiction, isn't it? It yeah. is the beauty of fiction. Yeah, so you, you end up, you start out with something that's real and you end up just kind of imagining what would have happened or what might have happened or what probably did happen or, you know, things like that. Uh, and it's really fun to do, after, especially after you're done and you can read it and think, <laughs> great. It's done, you know. But there were so many things, like my parents' names actually were Dick and Jane which was a constant joke, you know. I, I was born in 1940, so I grew up in that period at the end of the war and just after the war and was um, uh, 
a lot, a lot of my motivation in writing it was that I feel so sad that a whole world is gone. You know, that whole world that I grew up in in the late 40s and early 50s is just, just gone. And uh, all those people are gone, and I wanted to reproduce it, you know, and show what it was well, best I, I could. Sorry for interrupting. Okay, I just, no. I'm, 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 um, uh, the cover, um, and, and I don't know how many of you actually had an opportunity to see the cover, but it really is, it's a, a very original cover, and there's a, a small girl, probably, you know, supposed to be eight or nine, with, and that was the age yeah. you were. And it's very good because it also, one, sort of that, um, the, uh, the handwritten writing, and then the little girl herself, she looks both curious and tentative at the, at the, the same time. Uh -huh. And I think it's a really striking cover, and I wonder if you both, would talk about how you you know you decided was it the, was it more was it a collaboration and and maybe you could also speak generally Erica about how you go about choosing covers for your books. Well, um, we publish uh, in two seasons a year, and there's a, a cycle, a publishing cycle and a sales cycle that you follow. Uh, we happen to publish eight books a year, so it's four books each time. And we anticipate our sales meetings uh, by preparing a lot of materials to orient the sales group. And um, covers are very, cover designs are very important. We think of them as, uh, as marketing tools. But because we're a, uh, an, a small, nonprofit press, we have a lot of freedom, aesthetic freedom, that mainstream commercial publishers don't necessarily have uh, because they're much more narrowly focused on sales and marketing. It's not that we aren't focused on sales and marketing because we work very hard to market our books well and to sell them well, but we don't, um, we're much more editorially driven so that I have the privilege of being um, also the partially because we just don't have very many people working with us. Each one of us does a lot of different things. But I work very closely with the designers as well as other members of the team to try to capture the spirit of a book uh, in the visual of a cover in such a way that someone will be drawn to it without knowing in advance what it is. So it's a challenge to convey the spirit of something uh, to someone that will, in a way that will grab them and they'll, they'll, it, and will make them want to pick up the book and read it. And that's uh, what you did so well. I well, mean, it doesn't always just, work this well. I think we were very particularly lucky in this case. It was really amazing to me that it's so much right for the book. You know, it's exactly right for the book that cover, in my humble opinion. <laughs> um, and you, and she worked on. She rejected a bunch of things that were too, you know, kind of standard uh, retro. You know. And yeah, stuff we went like through that. a number of sketches with the designer. I don't design the covers myself. We work with graphic designers, who present us with electronic sketches. It's funny to call them sketches these days because I'm old enough to have worked in publishing before the digital age. Mm. I started in publishing in the 1980s and um, there were real sketches being done then. Uh, but now it's an interesting process now that we're doing everything digitally because you can't easily produce something that looks like a work in progress Hmm. through digital means. So it hmm. shifts the whole evolution of the art uh, for a cover design. And you end up with an array of options that take you in a variety of directions. Sometimes they're uh, iterations on a specific uh, concept. Sometimes they're wildly divergent. And um, when you present them to an author and to your sales force, you have to be ready for, you can't 
it, I think it's almost impossible for people to understand that it, you're, they're looking at something that can be adapted and, and changed mm -hmm. and can evolve because right. it looks like a finished product. Uh, so there's a psychological process that goes on also in trying to um, communicate uh, with marketing people uh, what your intentions are for something and bring them in at the same time that you're listening to them because presumably they're the ones who are on the front lines. They're out there meeting with the um, booksellers and if they feel that they don't have something that's visually appealing and strong conceptually, they feel that they're being hobbled and they don't have the tools they need. So it's a, it's a negotiation like so much, like the editorial conversations are negotiations as well. Yeah, they are. And their that's conversations, their dialogues, their, um, I, I love that aspect of the work because I'm able to get inside of a, 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 a cr the, the creative imagination and the, the creative process with a writer, but it is the writer's book. Mm -hmm. So the role of the editor and the publisher is to, I guess the cliche is that we're midwives in a sense. Right. Um, we're not uh, progenitors, we're not parents, we're, we're midwives. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's 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 a wonderful it's a wonderful privilege to be able to to be involved from it was my a good perspective. Good experience for me because partly because it was collaborative. You know that's one of the things I like about theater is that it's it's such a collaboration and everybody's involved in doing the whole thing. You know, and, and I was surprised that this was so much that way. However, we can never forget that it is the author's work and right. our role as publishers and editors is to s step aside, to stand behind uh, and to foster uh, the book through the process and, and into the world in a way that will serve it well. I really felt that it was like that, you know, which was, I know with a major publisher, it's not like that. They well, just tell you what it's going to be. It depends. Isn't that right? I mean, I've heard that. I think it depends. It's, uh, hmm. There are an array of experiences and, and right. having worked with a major publisher, several right. major publishers, I, I still work the way I always worked and that's probably why I'm in, in, in a small press context mm -hmm. now. <laughs> and, right. on, and on that topic, um, Eric, I would like to, to direct this question to you because, you know, I, I said it in, in my introduction that we wanted to talk about the realities of being an independent publisher. And you've just talked, you know, so eloquently how you, you know, you foster the work into the public. But you now, I believe, have been publishing for uh, 11 years. And um, and you've you know you've had uh, you, you've become you know well uh, well established well regarded, and so basically is publishing easier now than it was 11 years ago, or or, or is there still so many challenges that are always uh, you know causing you to, to to stumble in your path? Well, 11 years ago, I didn't know very much about what it meant to be an independent publisher and to work, to wear as many hats as I wear. Um, I, when I established the press, I worked roughly on the model that I knew, the division of labor uh, that I knew working for a large house. But instead of having departments, hmm. we had individuals who were assigned different aspects of the process. And we, as time went on, we bled more and more into each other and we supported each other in different ways. And the nice thing about having a very small team, uh, with, um, which has been largely consistent, but we've had some people come and others go uh, over time, people that at best will focus on the things that they're strongest at doing. Uh, so. The, the division of labor tends to um, evolve with the staff. But I have, having been in publishing as long as I have, uh, and ha having had my, a, a wonderful mentor in my first 
boss in publishing, whose name is Richard Merrick, uh, who had his own career stretch back into the early 60s, where he started in magazine publishing and then went into book publishing. He told me a lot of stories about the old days in publishing where um, they were flush with money from paperback reprinters and uh, it's always been difficult. It's always been difficult uh, to publish uh, artistic work um, as opposed to purely commercial work. But uh, there have been eras of publishing that have been detailed by different writers. Jason Epstein has written about it in a series in the New York Review of Books. Many years ago, it was turned into a book. Um, Andre Schifrin, who uh, uh, was a wonderful publisher, uh, founded the New Press, but grew up in mainstream publishing, uh, wrote about it for The Nation. That was turned into a book. And there have been other people who have chronicled the publishing business. What, Of course, what we're dealing with now is the uh, shift uh, in the distribution chain. When I first came into publishing, everybody was annoyed with Barnes & Noble because they went from chains, you know, the, the, the independent bookseller, the, the, the small bookseller, neighborhood bookseller, uh, was threatened by the chains, and then the superstores, and now we, we all want Barnes & Noble to survive because Amazon's eating everything up. So the distribution process ha dominates the whole process. And Amazon is, uh, has made books available, more books available to people than ever before. But on the other hand, they've swallowed up the smaller local bookshops. And they extract larger and larger discounts from publishers, which makes it more and more difficult to afford to publish at all. So there are many, many challenges. There's the format change, um, digital, uh, the digital um, revolution, we were told was gonna make everything easier and more accessible. In fact, it, it makes, we haven't, we, we do all our books both digitally and in paper formats, so it's really twice the work. Right. And uh, metadata, which is all the information that goes out over the ether uh, on books, it's, there's, there's hunger for it by the, the booksellers earlier and earlier in the process. So it's very difficult for publishers because when you work with writers, and this is one of the great joys of, of the publishing and editorial process, books evolve. You can start out having one notion of what a book is going to be, and halfway through it, you realize you've got something else, and it's all, all the more exciting for that evolution. However, now you've announced the book as it was four months right. earlier, and all that information is whether you like it or not out in the world. So you don't have certain freedoms that you used to have before you were tied down to metadata. Right. So there, uh, you know, I could go on and yes. on. Yes, and so, so much really for the technolo technological yeah. shortcuts. Yeah. They are flawed. Yeah. Now, we're going to probably take some questions now, but I would, um, I'd just like to ask you um, a, a, a final question because I believe that things are changing at the press, and I wondered if you could just give us an overview of uh, some of the things that are going to be happening in the future for Bellevue Literary Press. Okay, well, we were um, founded in, uh, our first books came out in 2007. Uh, we were founded, as I said earlier, suggested earlier, in the, um, within, as a project of the, of the School of Medicine at New York University Medical School. Uh, medical center, and um, we came about because of very specific individuals at a very particular time, and that's so often the case. Uh, it wasn't a question of vision of the medical center or uh, policy. Uh, there were independent projects at the School of Medicine in the medical humanities 
there's a wonderful, wonderful uh, literature and, and medicine uh, database that still exists. And as I mentioned earlier, we were uh, predated by the Bellevue Literary Review, which is still going strong and is a wonderful literary magazine. Uh, but these are projects that exist because of individuals who generated them. And the leadership of the School of Medicine and the Department of Medicine has shifted over the years, and there's less support for these projects right. that there was earlier. So um, we are uh, going off on our own and have established ourselves uh, as an independent nonprofit press, and uh, which, you know, we're, it, it's been a challenge to, because of our um, exception as a trade book house in the heart of a medical center, I know of no other uh, literary trade right. book publisher that exists in the context that we exist. Um, it's been a challenge because we're in a huge bureaucracy that doesn't operate according to our business model. So now we should be freer to really deal with things as a publisher does. Uh, and as far as the outside world is concerned, the shift should be invisible. Right, right. Well, well we wish you every success, of Thank course, in, 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 in this new direction. Um, and I think we will now take some questions from the audience. Before we get to the Q&A, please do remember this is being recorded and wait for the microphone to come to you before asking your question. Thank you. I actually have two for Diane and one for Erica, but I don't want to hog it, so maybe I could ask you after. Um, Diane, so what made you write in the present tense? Um, I just did, did started. Did feel more comfortable? I just for you? started doing it, oh. um, and then I kept on doing it. <laughs> uh, I liked the immediacy and the feeling when it, when I first when I first conceived of doing the book in the voice of a child. My idea of it really was as if you were in a hypnosis session and. Uh, in therapy as an adult, in which case you would be saying, okay, I see a chair, I see my mother come in the room, she's doing this, she's doing that, and I say this, and she says that, and I, I thought of it like that. Mm -hmm. And I went on with it for quite a while mm -hmm. in that mode. Mm -hmm. And I just kept on doing it until most of it was like that. The excerpt is, is great, I can't wait to get the book. Thank you. Um, <laughs> may I ask what jobs you had in the theater? I'm what, sorry, what? You said you work in the theater. In, I have. Work, yeah, as an actress or? I've done some acting, I've done some directing, mm -hmm. I've done props, I've mm -hmm. done lights, I've done, you know, I worked in little theaters in Dallas mm -hmm. for years, one and then another and another, and then I was in a little theater in Colorado when my husband was in the army out there, and um, which was great fun, and uh, you know, I went back, I even went back to school, took acting lessons, and um, you know, I just kept doing it over the years. I did some of it in high school, and I just keep, I go back to it periodically, which makes me kind of a uh, dilettante, I guess, but uh, some of my best friends even now are people I've been in theater with. You know, you just get to know people mm -hmm. so well doing that. And I've written some plays, I've worked with Ensemble Studio Theater here, uh, for several years and had some little plays done there and uh, you know Thank you. I still think I'm gonna write finish a play that I have. Thank you. Thank you. You were gonna ask Erica something. Oh afterwards. Well, oh. I don't want to hold it. Right? The same question. <laughs> Maybe the same question. <clears throat> Erica you mentioned independent publisher and that you're also a dot org. First of all, do you have a ceiling of how much money you can make as a dot org? How much the publisher can take in? No, not at all. Okay, great. So therefore, isn't it true that I, we, had, we seem to have a ceiling that's, un, that's not, 
we seem to not never take in enough money. Of course. <laughs> Neither does any of the, of the other publishers. Yeah. Um, I hear a lot of publishing stories. I'm a pianist. I play for different organizations. I play for Condé Nast, Board of Directors. And I hear the crybaby stories all the time. Mm -hmm. But wasn't Condé Nast and Random House and everybody else an independent publisher at one time? And how do they move they were, from... Right. How can you move from being independent to one of the front runners? Because, well, I consider that we're a front runner in the nonprofit small press world, and I don't have any aspirations to becoming a behemoth. A behemoth? So uh, we're a nonprofit. We're not a commercial house. Your Condé Nast has always been a for-profit operation. Well, they're not doing so well. Being a for these, these are tax tax uh, distinctions, uh, right. as you know. So, um, well, I mean, it's all about advertising within within the uh, publisher world, also, right? In the magazine. What does that mean? The magazine. You mean whether you're being uh, supported by advertising? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's something that the digital age caused to collapse. Was that you know the advertising income became scarce, uh, but. You know, we're all, we're all trying to, to make it work, whether we're for or nonprofit. And there are many wonderful, small, independent presses. And when I say small, Grove Press is a, considered an independent press, and I don't know if they're called a small press at this point. But um, we have a lot in common with their, their ethos as well. So it's an attitude as much as anything else. Um, mm -hmm. We are, um, we are on the smaller side publishing only eight books a year. Uh, but you can call yourself a small press like Grey Wolf does or Coffee House and publish, I don't know, 30 or 40 or 50 books a year as well. Um, Condé Nast, you know, Random House, which was uh, owned by Cy Newhouse along with Condé Nast, right? Um, belongs to the whole Bertelsmann empire now, as you know. So they're enormous. And this has happened. There's been a lot of consolidation in the publishing world, and I've seen it since I got into publishing out of college in the 80s. So um, there's also a, you know, on the, on the one hand, there's a, a rush toward consolidation, and on the other hand, there's a devolution. There's a wonderful, diverse... Uh, vital uh, small press community all across the country. So um, that, that people hear less about because they don't have the means to promote themselves in the same way. But they're out there. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I say something? And Bellevue is really well known. I, when I first started uh, when I first got a book contract and told old friends of mine in Dallas, um, my old book club friends in Dallas about it, they knew about you. You know, they said, oh, Bellevue, oh, they're really good. Oh, they're the best, you know, so well, that's, it's well that's known. Nice to hear. Well, we had part of that is due to the fa fact, it's largely due to the fact that um, a first novel that we published in 2009 won uh, the 2010 Pulitzer Prize in Fiction, and it, it was big news in the publishing community because it was the first time that a small publisher had won the Pulitzer Prize uh, since 1981 with the Confederacy of Dunces. Wow. So um, it, it, made, it made the news, mm -hmm. and... Um, that book is called Tinkers by Paul Harding, and it was a book that uh, made it to the Pulitzer because uh, there was an enormous uh, readership for it that just developed through the, the, the fabled word of mouth phenomenon, which is really something once you see it up close. It's very, very rare. Mm -hmm. um, and there are many brilliant books that don't, for whatever reason, if we knew the formula, we'd all be wealthy, <laughs> and we'd all be very successful. But it happens for, 
for reasons that you can't, you can only explain after the fact and that's not really very useful. It's fascinating because it created a community of people who, mm. who loved the book so much that they talked to each other and they continue to talk to each other and feel good about the fact that everybody who loves the book feels like that success is their success as well. So. Hmm. so did you feel then, because that was quite early on in your um, yeah. uh, publishing history as mm -hmm. an independent publisher mm -hmm. at, at Bellevue mm -hmm. Literary Press, did you feel that that changed your trajectory? Oh, it put us on the map, absolutely. And that Pulitzer Prize was followed by a National Book Award nomination for a first novel. Uh, and we've, as a result, um, we get wonderful review coverage. Which, which is so vital, and yeah. that fine. Um, I have another question I'm yeah. going to ask you, because obviously review publications are shrinking That's and right. vanishing, so it must be m much more of a challenge now, but I'm delighted to hear that doors still open for you know, your exceptional press. Yes, thank you. Um, it, it's very interesting to look back to the review coverage that Tinker's got in 2009, and 2010 because there's a long list of, if you go on our site, you can see we have author pages. Diane has one. Every one of our authors and books has its own page on our website. And you can, um, you can unhide the list of reviews and you'll see the, the great chain of reviews and the names of the newspapers that no longer exist. Wow. That the book was reviewed mm -hmm. in. So um, these are, you know, the Sacramento Bee. There are a lot of, there are a lot of wonderful uh, newspapers that had culture sections and book review columnists that just have, have dried up, have disappeared. So it's kind of sad, but that's, right. that's it. And the, and the net, the internet has not, um, you know, that's burgeoned. There are a lot of blogs that people have where they write about books and, um, there are online uh, journals and newspapers that cover books, but it's not the same thing. I was but, surprised I had so many little, nice little reviews mm -hmm. and things, Kirkus and all those people. That was wonderful. <laughs> Last question. Hmm? You, you work on the conjunction, the juxtaposition of art and science. Mm -hmm. Is it art and or science, or is it a conjunction? And how do you think about that? Okay. <clears throat> the way I think about it is that we put, publish books of ideas and artistry. And we redefine that, that nexus with each book that we publish. That's my slithery response to your question. <laughs> uh, it isn't meant to be a constraining Identi identity. It's meant to signal that we're interested in interdisciplinarity and dialogue uh, between the arts and the sciences. And the nonfiction tends to be more narrative nonfiction on issues of science or biographies of scientists. And the fiction tends to have a theme that may be medical, but not sometimes just a light motif, not necessarily a, a, a determining theme. I never publish uh, because a theme interests me or an idea interests me. I publish because I feel that the rendering of certain ideas is exceptional. Uh, and I know I've succeeded when people look at a particular book and they say, what does this have to do with science or medicine? They said that with tinkers. They said, why, you know, what does tinkers have to do with medicine or science? It's about three generations of men, basically, and growing up in, in hard scrabble, poverty in Maine, turn of the century into mid 20th century. And I say, well, let's see, on the first page, you've got a man who's dying, who, in, who's being described uh, in, the, in the midst of a process where his body is breaking down. 
you have a, his father he, he thinks about as he's going through this process where his body is, 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 is dying. He um, is transported back into his childhood memories and he remembers his father who left the family when he was very young and his father had epilepsy. And there are extraordinary descriptions of um, seizures as though his father is being um, run through with uh, the electrical, an electrical storm. Uh, so if an, a writer succeeds in creating a work of art, you kind of forget about what it is that, I mean, that's that you're gripped by it. You're not thinking that you're being, it's not didactic, if you understand me. It's, it, it's conveying information almost in spite of itself. That's not its goal. Its goal is to, is to transport you and to open your mind and to, and to cause your imagination to, to travel. So that's what we aim for. Uh, and it's, there's a lot of freedom there. Uh, you know, if I, I could come up with a rationale for having chosen Diane's book. I mean, she talks about PTSD with her father. PTSD, that's it, right? Post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, right. But it's not about PTSD. It's about growing up in this place and time, and it's about the characters, and it's about the way she writes about them. So that's what's important is the is the beauty of and the craft and the and the power of art to to instruct and to move and to and to allow you to travel imaginatively. That seems a perfect way to end. <laughs>Thank you. Um, well, we'd, thank you we'd really much. like to thank you. Thank you, uh, really, for you know your eloquent overview of independent publishing. Diane, your story is completely inspirational. That yes. you know, yes, absolutely. That persistence paid off, and you were published. And not only were you published, but you were published by one of the finest independent presses in the country. That's Truly, true. Bellevue Literary Press is really a, a remarkable press, and it is. Of course, the independent presses that contribute to the life uh, lifeblood of culture in our country. So, thank you both so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we um, we would like to make a presentation to you both, and to do so is our executive director, Victoria Dangle. Yes, thank you. And I just want to. Uh, echo Karen's comments, but I just want to say what I really love most about, well, first of all, I'm excited to read your book, but I love the chemistry between the two of you, and I love how uh, grateful you are and humble. You're surprised at, you know. Well, what would I do? It, no, but it's, it's really, <laughs> no, it's so beautiful to see, which makes me think your book is very sensitive, so thank you so much. And what an accomplishment. You know, you came in and out of writing for all those years, and then you hit the nail on the head. That's beautiful, it's so. It really saves my life. It's, it's amazing, it's, it's so she's amazing. A, she's a wonderful writer. I mean, you know, it's not just, this wasn't a, well, there's a lot of luck and, that, and chance that goes into any Right. Anything that's good in life, right? But right. I fell in love with her book before I fell in love with her. So oh. the work speaks for itself. And I hope you'll all buy a copy. Thank you. And read it. <laughs> yes. Truly. And as they say, you know, God moves in mysterious ways. The book is at the right time and at this point in your life, because it's the book it is. So yeah. this is, it's just all so, so perfect. So on behalf of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York, founded 1785, we express our gratitude to Diane DeSanders, author, Hap and Hazard, and the End of the World, but the beginning of your writing career, <laughs> for her participation in the General Society Labor, Literature, and Landmark Lecture Series. So thank you. Oh my God, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Wow, it looks so official. Oh. 
<laughs> and, and Erica. Um, and we are wishing you great success with your, uh, as you take the company to new heights. So, and we thoroughly enjoyed your uh, insight and your presentation. So the, um, the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York, I can't say that enough, founded 1785, 233 years ago, express, we express our gratitude to Erica Goldman, publisher and editorial director of Bellevue Literary Press for her participation in the General Society Labor, Literature, and Landmark Lecture Series. So there you thank go. Thank you very thank much. You. And well, thank one you. Other thing. This is so nice. Because as your career evolves, uh, Diane, you'll need a place to, well, when you're in Midtown, you can come and write here because you're a, a lifetime member of the library oh, now. thank you. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and Erica, you as well. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, uh, thanks to Erica and Diane again. Uh, thank you so much for coming this evening. I want to remind you that this wonderful book is now for sale and available for purchase. And uh, Diane, perhaps you will uh, join our lovely uh, bookseller, Lee, to yes. sign books. And I also hope that you will join us for a glass of wine. Thank you so much for coming this evening, and we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you.